Good afternoon. Dean Pearl, Borough President Brewer, Councilman Rosenthal, Trustee Burke, Trustee Arvanides, Associate Vice Chancellor McIntosh, Chair McCauley, Vice Chair Meyer, Presidents Cruz and Rab, faculty, administrator, graduates, and family, it's good to see you. I, I will be honest that when I got the invite to join you today, I had to Google the Macaulay Honors College. I know CUNY well. My mom actually is a graduate of Lehman, though she went in when it was Hunter. I have friends who are CUNY professors, and during my senior year of high school, I took two fantastic philosophy classes at Hunter College. I still think about to this day. But in this city, things change quickly. And when I was your age in New York City, Macaulay did not yet exist. And now here it is, and here you are, and here I am, and I couldn't be happier. I had the great honor to meet a number of you at a lunch a few weeks ago, and I have to say I came away ecstatic and inspired. This great public institution embodies what is best about this city, its diversity, its dynamism, its curiosity. I'm so very glad your invitation led me to discover who you are, for one of the true joys of New York is the joy of perpetual discovery, though it's always shot through with a sense of bittersweet loss. The hardware store where you bought your first power drill is now a cheese shop. The pizza joint where you had your first middle school date is now a condo tower. As you can tell, I'm already slipping into nostalgia here because, well, let's be honest, a commencement is nothing if not a festival of nostalgia. Your very proud family is sitting there next to you. They're fighting back tears of pride, remembering you as chubby little babies and haphazard toddlers and being entirely overwhelmed by all of it. This is your day, but it is also theirs. And many of them have been waiting and working towards this day a lot longer than you. So before I say anything else, let's give all the parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and siblings in the audience a big round of applause. Now, I, I don't know you as well as they do. To be clear, I don't, I don't really know you at all. But, but. As the Dean was just saying, I feel strongly as if I do because you are my people. And by that I obviously don't mean you're all television hosts. Oh God no, thank God no. No, by my people I mean you're all what I'm going to call here today Outer Borough Strivers. And before Borough President Brewer is offended by that, I mean the term sort of conceptually rather than geographically. What I mean here is um, you, the comic book nerds of Co-op City, the science geeks of East New York, the comic book obsessives of Stapleton. You're part of this tribe. Inwood, the neighborhood just north of us, Washington Heights where we stand, this is part of the archipelago of the Outer Borough Striver, the birthplace of my friend and fellow Outer Borough Striver, Lynn Memo Miranda. Yonkers and the Five Towns are part of this as well, and some of you, like me, are from the Bronx. You had to traverse vast expanses of the city to get to school every day. We were all knit together, we Outer Borough Strivers, by a few key experiences. Most of us, almost all of us, I'd be willing to bet, come from the ungilded New York. The New York not of privilege and summer homes, but of the working and middle classes and the poor. We are creatures of this metropolis, raised on the subway, attuned to its rhythms. We are also wildly ambitious, ready to grab the brass ring. We raise our hands and say, oh, oh, I know the answer, when the teacher asks a question. You see, I wasn't lying when I said I knew you. You are my people. And as a fellow Outer Borough Striver, I view today as an opportunity to do a little time traveling and bring you a message from the future. I cannot really tell you anything about what lies before you today except one thing I can absolutely guarantee, which is that you will fail. I know, that's not really the uplifting commencement message you were hoping for, but bear with me because in the end it's good news. What I'm saying is a, is a very simple truth, and it's derived from the basic law of large numbers, the way probabilities work. You will undertake thousands of projects in your life across relationships, friendships, jobs, other hobbies, and pursuits. And as that set of activities gets larger and larger, as you roll the dice again and again, you are going to eventually and inevitably come up snake eyes. Some of you, I'm sure, have already failed, maybe even pretty badly. And if you have, you're lucky. You really are, because you, you've had the experience of going to bed at night feeling crappy and then waking up the next morning to realize that you had not actually died of embarrassment or shame. Maybe you've learned something useful about the task at hand, or maybe, crucially, you've come away with a funny, true, and self-deprecating anecdote you can dine out on for years. <laughs> Believe me, those are gold. Hold on to those. <laughs> Whatever you've taken away from your failures, if you've experienced them, you've been somewhat immunized against the soul-crushing experience I had, which was that my first real, true, big failure came when I was 34 years old, and it happened in front of millions of people. 
In 2013, I was named the new APM host at MSNBC, having just spent a year and a half hosting a kind of boutique weekend morning show that had found a small but devoted audience. And my ascent to being a primetime host had been almost bizarrely frictionless, one thing leading to another until there I was, the youngest primetime host on cable news. Now, I want to be very clear. I'm a hard enough worker, but there are people in this industry who work hard for years, who are just as creative, who are smarter and better at this job than I have, who have never gotten that opportunity. I was insanely lucky. And the funny thing is, I remember thinking it wouldn't be that hard. Right? I would make a show, I'd go on, I'd talk about it, and after an hour would go by, I'd get off and everyone would love it. That's not what happened. Um, one thing you have to understand about my job, and, and I think that the people in this room will, will sort of understand uh, how intense this is. I, I get a grade every day, okay? At 4.15 p.m. every single day, a spreadsheet is emailed out to the network that shows in 15-minute increments the ratings for every show on our network and on our competitors. And people pour over this document looking not just at their own numbers, but other people's too. It's like if you were tested every single day in class, and then the next day, everyone's marked exams were tacked to the wall for everyone to gaze upon. My first night, after great fanfare, marketing, publicity, the show came off without a hitch. We celebrated and toasted that night at a fancy midtown restaurant, and even better, the next day, the ratings were fantastic. But then, the ratings our second night were awful. And I mean, like, historically terrible. Like, a number no one had seen before? <laughs> it didn't have the right digits in it? It was a number uh, that made my heart drop. And, and here's what it meant. A lot of people checked us out night one, hoping they would like what they saw, and instead they were like, no, I don't like that. I felt sticks to my stomach. It was a kind of nauseous vertigo, and it went on and on for weeks, months, and then truly years. Bad grade after bad grade for everyone to see. The industry press and then the non-industry press started writing up articles about the show's poor performance. There were articles about imminent cancellation and blind quotes about how everyone I knew Everyone knew that I was a dead man walking. I was failing and flailing publicly, and I'm going to be absolutely honest with you up here at this podium that it absolutely emotionally wrecked me. The problem, which I now recognize and can share with you, having time travel back with wisdom from the future, was how hilariously unprepared I was for it all. Because somehow I had lulled myself into thinking it would all be easy. Not in the sense that it wouldn't be a lot of effort. No, I was prepared for that. But that the relationship between the effort and the results would be uncomplicated. I'm very used to working hard, but I went into the show thinking that I'd put in the hours, I'd work my butt off, I'd get good results. And that's not what happened. And you know why that's not what happened? Because it turns out that hosting a primetime TV show is harder than it looks. But here's the thing, and this is the crucial lesson. That's not just a lesson about my particular job. It's a lesson about every job. In fact, it's a lesson about every single human endeavor. Being a janitor is harder than it looks, and being a labor and delivery nurse is harder than it looks. Running a bodega is harder than it looks. Being a parent, oh my God, is it harder than it looks. <laughs> being a single parent might be the only exception to this rule because it looks so hard, but even that is probably harder than it looks. Being a good friend is harder than it looks. Being a loving partner is harder than it looks. Being a righteous and active citizen in our shared democracy at this moment in particular is harder than it looks. And in general, being a grounded and disciplined and joyful human being walking the face of the earth is harder than it looks. This has become a mantra for me as I approach middle age, and it's born of the trauma of the show's launch. Everything is harder than it looks. And while that might sound like a recipe for discouragement, I've actually found it wildly helpful in navigating life because it helps you prepare better, which in turn makes it more likely you'll succeed. Think about it. When you're about to lift something heavy, you take a center to center yourself. You take a deep breath, engage your core, make sure you use your legs. But if you underestimate how much something weighs, if you, for instance, grab luggage you thought was empty but was not, you will very likely throw your back out. That's another life lesson for you. Heavy luggage often looks exactly like empty luggage. <laughs> I speak from experience. But if you understand that things are nearly always harder than they look, you can discipline yourself into taking care of the tasks before you. 
And then if you step back, you see that this lesson is so much bigger than that. The most important part of seeing human life as harder than it looks is that it inculcates compassion, both for yourself, which if you are a lifelong A student, you may desperately need, but just as importantly for others. If you understand that failure is inevitable because life is harder than it looks, then you are more inclined to cut yourself some slack and cut others some slack as well. It will inoculate you from the temptation to look down on those who are struggling. It will save you from the particularly American delusion of believing that our entire social pyramid with a few people at top and a huge base of schlubs on the bottom is a just one. Because it's not. It's actually a really damaging myth. By having respect for everyone's struggle, for understanding that it's harder than it looks, you can help dismantle that myth. I'm a parent now, uh, uh, so I kind of get to impart commencement-style wisdom all the time. <laughs> Look at the breakfast table or just when we're hanging out. Even when, or especially when it prompts aggressive eye-rolling for my very precocious six-year-old daughter. Uh, my three kids, who I love so much, I feel like an insane person half the time, are, are not really outer borough strivers. We live in Brooklyn, my oldest goes to public school, but frankly, they move in a world of comfort, and I feel it's my mission as a parent to instill in them the natural hustle, like the kind that my upbringing and yours produced. And part of that is not letting yourself get easily dissuaded by the difficulty of a task. This winter, for some reason, I think mostly to get out of the house because winter in New York City with a bunch of kids can drive you crazy, we started going ice skating as a family. And maybe that's something you do. I, I didn't when I was a kid. And the first time my kids were on the ice, they were unsteady to say the least. But my then three-year-old son, David, insisted with full body passion, he would accept no help. Not from his dad and not from anyone. He'd bite his cute little lip with determination, square his shoulders and proceed to wipe out over and over and over. He would take one step and then one of his skates would fly up in front of him, sending his little body back onto the ice. It's okay, buddy, I'd reassure him, sneakily Googling the symptoms of concussion. <laughs> it's fine. Falling is part of learning. Falling is part of learning became a kind of family mantra that day as we all slid across the ice. After about an hour, David looked up at me after yet another fall and said with earnestness, conviction, and pride, I'm learning a lot. So my wish for you today, graduates, is that you somehow manage to channel my three-year-old son with his little cranium lying on the cold ice. May you find the equanimity to understand what will be your certain failures are a natural part of figuring things out. And that is still one of the greatest, most satisfying experiences that we humans get to enjoy at any age. May you spend many years learning a lot. Congratulations, class of 2018. Good luck. Thank you so much for those really inspiring and touching remarks. Will Dean Ugaretz and Mr. McCauley join me? I will read our proper proclamation about you, and they will present you with your doctoral hood. So here begin the whereases, okay? Whereas, Christopher Lafredo Hayes, through his written and broadcast journalism, has made significant contributions to enhance critical thinking through investigation, political analysis, and social commentary, and whereas, his work explores issues of social justice, equality, representative democracy, and the lived experience of people from diverse backgrounds, and whereas he has been a leader in explaining complicated ideas and issues to a wide public audience, promoting clear communication and critical analysis, and whereas he has been recognized by his peers with an Emmy Award and has also been a successful essayist, author, and editor, and whereas he has epitomized the spirit and mission of Macaulay Honors College and the City University of New York, therefore, Macaulay Honors College awards Christopher Hayes the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, Honoris Causa. <laughs> 